Welcome to the study of the readings assigned for this upcoming Sunday, which are from the book of Habakkuk, the Gospel of Luke, and Paul's second letter to Timothy. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you that as we come once again to hear your word, to study it, that our minds, our hearts, our spirits are open to what you would have us hear. What each one of us need to know about you and how we need to relate to you and how you relate to us. Just thank you, Lord, that you're in our lives every day of the, every day and every moment of the day. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is alive within us and will enlighten us about you and about the world that you've given us to live within about the world you're going to give to us as we one day are able to join you and hear your word directly. So we thank you and praise you for this lesson. Receive it in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. This coming Sunday is the 27th Sunday in the liturgical season, Ordinary Time. We'll study the readings chronologically with the first reading from the Old Testament in the book of Habakkuk. Then study the New Testament reading from the Gospel of Luke and finish our study with a second reading from Paul's second letter to Timothy and see how the readings all relate to one another. Also added to our study today will be a study of the Jewish feast of Yom Kippur. Putting our readings in a time relationship on our timeline, this coming Sunday's first reading from the book of Habakkuk takes place around 620 B.C. The events from the Gospel reading from Luke are in 30 AD. And the second letter to Timothy was written around 66 AD. Enlarging this section of the timeline, we see Habakkuk is prophesying after the northern kingdom of Israel has been destroyed and the people taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 BC. He resides in the remaining southern kingdom of Judah the purple time bar, and the area on the map, which is also purple. His writing is recorded just before the southern kingdom of Judah is invaded by the Babylonians, the temple destroyed, and the people taken back captive to Babylon in 586 BC. While most books of prophecy in the Old Testament describe what the prophets said to the people regarding their need to repent and return to God, Habakkuk does not. His three-chapter writing is a personal description about his own conversation with God. Our first reading this Sunday reflects Habakkuk's plea to God and the response that he receives. So we begin at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. How long, O Lord? I cry for help, but you do not listen. I cry out to you, violence, but you do not intervene. Why do you let me see ruin? Why must I look at misery? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and clamorous discord. Habakkuk looked at the violence and injustice around him in the southern kingdom of Judah. This illustration here shows Habakkuk pleading to God, wondering where he is and why God did not set things right with the Jewish people. He asks a question we hear often, even today. Why does God allow the destruction and then violence? After verse 3, God tells Habakkuk about the coming army of Babylon that will destroy the nation and take the people captive. So Habakkuk wants to know why God would allow the Babylonians, who are much worse than the people in Judah, to be the destroyer of Judah. Habakkuk then says he will wait for an answer, an account of which is in chapter 2, where the Sunday's second reading continues. Chapter 2, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write down the vision clearly on the tablets so that one can read it readily. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment and will not disappoint. If it delays, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not be late. The rash one has no integrity, but the just one, because of his faith, shall live. 
So here in chapter two is the Lord's answer to what Habakkuk had asked. He is told to write down plainly so that all who read it will understand it. And verse four here is God describing those who have turned from him as rash people. They respond on instinct, are only interested in fulfilling their lusts, are full of themselves, trust in their own personal wealth, and have no integrity. On the other hand, those who are just, those who live by God's word and follow it, are those who cher God cherishes. They live by faith. Other translations of the second half of verse 4 say it exactly in those words. The just shall live by faith. We are called to live by faith, not be influenced by how we feel or what the circumstances might look like. Three of Paul's letters specifically quote from this verse. In his letter to the Romans, 117, he writes, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, 3.11, he writes, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. The book of Habakkuk demonstrates, regardless of how we feel or what it looks like around us, if we keep our faith and trust in him, we can be assured that he will see us through all situations and we will overcome all adversity. For the remainder of chapter 2, God elaborates on those who will see destruction in their lives, the greedy who live only for gain and for themselves, the violent who look to shedding of blood as the solution, the drunkard who brings shame instead of glory, and the idolater who seeks solace in images of stone and wood. So God is saying here, don't worry, his solution will readily be seen. I don't think that the prophets are only out to preach death and destruction to those who turn away from God. They typically contain message, messages of uplifting for what God is going to do for humanity. Chapter 3 is one of the most majestic in all scripture and records the result when Habakkuk stands in faith and trusts in the Lord and rejoices even though things may look bleak, because the glory and power of God will be manifested. The book of Habakkuk ends with this passage, which Habakkuk identifies as lyrics to be sung. Chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, Though the flock is cut from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Next is the gospel reading. The Sunday's gospel reading is from chapter 17 of Luke's gospel. And we'll start with the verse 1 that leads up to Sunday's reading, which starts at verse 5. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender, and if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. Jesus' account of Lazarus and the rich man that we studied last week in chapter 16 makes clear that eternity is real. There is an afterlife. As the world, the secular world, becomes more godless, more ungodly acts will occur against godly people. Those who do ungodly things would be better off if they had a millstone hanged about their neck and drowned. Who are the little ones that he writes about here in verse 2? 
That's us, Christians, we're the little ones. We are his little ones written about. We are the little ones, his children, and God sees us that way. We are to forgive other Christians as many times as they ask forgiveness. At the time, rabbis taught he only needed to forgive up to three times a day. So this is a message that resonates with his disciples as he's teaching them. God likewise forgives. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteousnesses, the things that we try to do to gain right standing with God, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And then 1 John 1, 9 says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then the gospel reading itself begins at verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Since the apostles here are asking to have their faith increased, it's assumed they are asking to increase their faith to be able to forgive in the way that Jesus has just taught them. It's through the act of forgiveness, in fact, that miraculously relationships are restored. As to increasing our faith, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, that to everyone is given the measure of faith. It's up to us to cultivate it and make it grow. Who among you would say to your servant, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here immediately and take your place at table? Would he not rather say to him, prepare something for me to eat? Put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink. You may eat and drink when I am finished. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. So here verse 10 says, we're the servants. We have an ongoing debt that we can never repay. Only Jesus on the cross was able to take our sins. Yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's. To reference again, 1 John 1, 1.9, it says, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just some, but all unrighteousness. If we walk in obedience to his word, we can live in the righteousness of God as a result of what Jesus did on the cross, blotting out our sins, nailing them to the cross, as Paul writes in Colossians 2.14. We follow what he says, then someday we can expect him to say, when we meet him face to face, well done, good and faithful servant. Now the verses that follow this reading at verse 11 are next week's gospel verses, so we will study those next week. So the first reading shows us that even though the nation may fail, like the southern kingdom of Judah that Habakkuk experienced, and the gospel say we will all stumble, God's mercy will be seen by the nation as well as by us individually. If we trust in him, live by faith, and know that righteousness is ours when we ask and receive forgiveness. The second reading is from Paul's second letter to Timothy. Paul's two letters to Timothy and the one to Titus are considered the pastoral letters because they're instructional for pastors Timothy and Titus in their respective churches. Timothy is ministering in Ephesus, and Titus is in Crete. They were written to encourage their faith and provide advice and teaching for these first century pastors. Paul's first letter to Timothy and his letter to Titus are thought to be written between 62 and 67 AD, between his first and second imprisonment in Rome while he was in Macedonia. Paul's second letter that we will study here, second letter to Timothy, was written during Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, shortly before his death, around 66 AD. This letter is the last writing that we have of Paul's. 
It was during this time that Nero was now the emperor of Rome and had begun severe persecution of the Christians. The reading itself this Sunday is only in verses 6 to 8 and 13 and 14. We will read the verses in between and see the context of the reading. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So while he awaits execution, Paul begins this letter with the same calm and confidence he always expressed in a spirit of faith and grace. He acknowledges once again his position as an apostle, no less than the one of the original 12 disciples, not of his will, but as he says, by the will of God. Nowhere else in the New Testament is the gospel called the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. It's a continuation of the series of attributes that Paul connects to the gospel. In his letter to the Romans, he wrote, it is the power of God let loose among men unto salvation. The second letter to the Corinthians, he writes, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes, the unsearchable riches in Christ. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul describes the gospel as Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in his first letter to Timothy that we have been studying recently, he writes, the glorious gospel, of the blessed God. All these phrases amplify the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus that he writes here. It's only with life in Christ Jesus that we live a life of any meaning, of any value. Everything we do outside of Christ leads to emptiness. Life is only in him, through him, and with him. What makes up the daily supply of life in Christ Jesus? He writes it here in verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace is what God provides us with no effort on our part and something we do not deserve. It cleanses us of sin. It welcomes us to share in his presence and love. It gives us the strength to obey his word. It provides us with the understanding and insight to learn his ways through the Holy Spirit. Mercy is unlike grace in that grace gives us what we do not deserve. And mercy withholds that which we do deserve. Our lives are tempered and our trials adjusted so as not to be such a burden that we cannot bear them. Jesus said there is not any trial which we cannot bear with his help. The Psalms tell us that it is only by God's mercy that we are not consumed. And peace is then possible when one has the inner sense of well-being with the realization that God is in charge. He has everything under control, no matter how dark things may look, and all will work out to our good and God's glory. And remember, Paul is writing this while he's in a prison cell, so he needs to be assured of all this, too. Then verse 3. I'm grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. So even though he's in prison, Paul never backs off his faith in the Lord. He also gives a little insight here into Timothy's family, as both his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice are also believers. From this I am sure that Timothy gains much support and confidence in his ministry from them. Then the reading begins at verse 6. I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. For God not did give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. So do not be ashamed of your testimony to our Lord, nor of me a prisoner for his sake, but bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. 
So verse six is a transition from ver the first five verses to the next six verses. Verse six says, don't be afraid to use your spiritual gifts and don't be afraid to share Christ with others. And in verse seven, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. Now, other translations say this, God has not given us the spirit of fear. This statement of Paul's teaches that Christians are forbidden to be cowards. Cowardice and fear are not from God. What makes one a coward? Fear. Being afraid if you do something, it will not turn out right. So fear is the opposite of faith. And as he says here, it's a spirit. We do have the spirit of power, love, and, a, and of self-control. Other translations say a sound mind, power and love and a sound mind. It's only through a sound mind that we have self-control. Now, what might Timothy be fearful of? That people won't listen to him. Or worse, they think that what he is saying has no relevance or value. So Paul turns to something that most Christians are faced with in their daily life, being reluctant to express their Christianity with non-Christians. What was Timothy to be ashamed or fearful of? First of all, Jesus is invisible. And an unbelieving world cannot understand how anyone can have an intimate, loving relationship with someone who's invisible. And to believe that a man who lived 2,000 years ago is alive today? Impossible. But people today believe in all sorts of other spiritual things. The things that are of Satan have nothing to do with God. But they think those are okay and to dabble in them. The second thing that Timothy may be ashamed or fearful of is that what even may have given Timothy even more difficulty is that Paul is now in prison, a political prisoner viewed as an enemy of the state. And if Timothy is associated with Paul to other people, Timothy must be an enemy of the state as well. And the third thing that he may be fearful of is that the gospel is contrary to man's way of thinking. Man's arrogance and pride says we can solve our own problems. To have to rely on someone else is an insult. Their faith is in themselves and their own abilities, but the gospel is a declaration that man is helpless and lost, and Jesus is the solution. So it becomes difficult to speak to those who are proud individuals who consider themselves self-made. There are two phrases Paul uses that can help us overcome the tendency to avoid speaking of the Lord to non-believers. In verse 8, it says, Bear your share of hardship, or share in the suffering for the gospel, with the strength that comes from God. Now, emphasis is on the strength that comes from God. It's the power of God that will give you the strength, the assurance that what you talk about and demonstrate in your life is the true reality that we must represent to others. In verse 13, coming up, we'll say, to hold fast to the form of sound words, or follow the pattern of sound words. People respect and worship power. By realizing that the power is in the gospel we share with others, there can be no shame. When, do, when we do what the scripture tells us to do, it leads to our wholeness of spirit, soul, and body. That is what holy means. God considers us a holy people, whole in our spirit, in our soul, and our body. Then the letter continues, but is not in the reading on Sunday. It says, who saved us? and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So verse 9 is telling us it's the power of the gospel that has given each of us eternal life, not anything we can work to achieve. It is a gift. It is what Nicodemus was told by Jesus, that we must be born again, that we cannot make it happen ourselves. What we in the Episcopal and Roman Catholic churches 
do not do is have altar calls for individuals to come forward and make a public commitment to the Lord. We teach unbelievers and do not ask them to make a public commitment. We make it a collective commitment. It says here, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling, called us to live in wholeness. And verse 10 tells us it's the power of God that has abolished, or better translated, nullified death. Jesus has canceled out what the consequences of death were before we accepted salvation. That's why Paul writes in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 55, death, where is your sting? Thus, death of our body results in life to be lived in its fullest degree, permanently enjoyed in the future. Then the letter continues, verse 11, for this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. So Paul's not saying he has chosen to suffer for Jesus, but because of his teaching as an apostle of Christ, he has to endure the response of an unbelieving and wayward world. He's not concerned or afraid because he knows God has everything under control. Paul's job is to just keep on teaching the word. We in America are blessed for being able to live and share our Christian beliefs. Many Christians around the world are not so fortunate and are imprisoned or even killed for professing belief in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the reading continues on verse 13. Take as your norm the sound words that you heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard this rich trust with the help of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. So he's talking about take as your norm the sound words that you heard from me, that he has used words with them that are should be the norm that they use when they teach. Following his words as a guide to our behavior, standing against the world's way and following God's way. Standing by what we know is right against the practices of the secular world that has made fornication, cheating on our taxes, even gossiping as being acceptable behavior because everybody does it. Back in verse 7, it said, Guard the truth with the help of the Holy Spirit. Christianity is not a religion. It is the truth that provides for us a means by which our life is to be lived. Christianity is a way of life, not a religion. The Bible is God's instruction manual for humanity. It's not in our intellect which makes the word of God real. It is the Holy Spirit in us that enlightens our mind through our spirit. Then the letter continues, you are aware that all who are in Asia have turned away from me, including Pugilus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. When he arrived in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well how much service he rendered in Ephesus. So here, verse 15, is speculation is that Vagelus and Hermogenes were originally converts of Paul who turned away from his teaching, as apparently many did, especially since he's now in prison. Since Timothy is teaching what he learned from Paul about the walk of faith, he too may be subject to believers turning away from Timothy's teaching. The turning away may be similar to what, what that which occurs after a period of revival. Most recently, during the 60s and 70s, a Jesus movement among the young and a renewal of the Holy Spirit, which brought on a firestorm of a profession of faith and people being baptized in the Holy Spirit, as the term is used. But then the revival waned as the fire cooled, and according to the intellectual analysis that was done at the time, cooler heads prevailed. But this is not a flash in the pan thing that is to be embraced only when we feel the spirit and look for a spiritual high to keep it going. It's when the feeling and ecstasy subsides that faith is most difficult to maintain. At the time that Paul writes this letter, 
the turmoil in the Roman Empire was highly evident. Just four years later, the Roman armies would attack the temple in Jerusalem and destroy it, scattering the Jewish people. Verse 16, here is Onesiphorus, an Ephesian believer, who was not ashamed of Paul's chains and sought him, uh, sought him out when he went to Rome. He ministered to Paul, not wringing his hands and fearful of the persecutions that were occurring, but uplifted Paul, putting his trust in God, trusting that God has everything under control. In chapter 2 of his letter, Paul will turn to detailed instructions on how to guard this rich trust with the help of the Holy Spirit that we'll, we'll study next week, which will be next week's second reading. So we have the first reading from the Old Testament and the Gospel, both which teach the importance of living by faith. Habakkuk tells us the just shall live by faith, and Jesus teaches in Luke's Gospel how faith works. Paul then gives us instruction on how we must maintain our faith in the Word of God and show our faith by not being ashamed of living according to the teachings of Jesus and by not conforming to the practices of the secular world. No one says living by faith is an easy thing to do, but the more you do, the easier it becomes. It's through our faith that we can be assured of receiving the peace that passes all understanding, as the scripture says. It's a peace that only comes about through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now we'll turn to our continued study that we started last week of the seven biblical feasts in fulfillment by Jesus. As we reviewed last week, Jesus fulfilled the spring feasts on the day that they were held while he spent his last days here on the earth. The expectation then is that Jesus will fulfill the three fall appointed feasts that will be held on the specific days that they are held sometime in the future. We're currently in the midst of the three fall feasts celebrated by the Jewish people ever since God instituted them through Moses over 3,600 years ago. As we studied last week, this past Sunday, the first day of the seventh month on the Jewish calendar and September 25th on the Gregorian calendar, it's the Jewish New Year. And that's when the New Year began this past Sunday, the Jewish New Year, the first of the three fall feasts. The book of Acts tells us Jesus will return just as he left. So the assumption is that because he ascended from the Mount of Olives, he will return there as well on a future Rosh Hashanah. And we looked at the study that Revelation 19, 11 through 16 describes us thinking that that is a description of how Jesus will appear when he returns. So I recorded what it looked like in Jerusalem at sundown this past Sunday when Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, began. Here's what it looked like at 6.31 p.m. Looking to the east, Sundown is at 6.32. So here is sundown, but there's not, we don't hear anything. I didn't hear any chauffeurs being sounded. The ramps were long. Just looking to the lights are turned on, as you can see on the right-hand side. The right-hand side, by the way, where the partition is, that's where the women come to the wall, and the left-hand side of the partition is for the men. And at 6.38, you can hear the prayers being said. 
read from Revelation chapter 19 as the passages which are interpreted to describe Jesus' return on the day of trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, sometime in the future. The two men who stood there with the in front of the disciples after Jesus rose uh, and uh, ascended to heaven on the Mount of Olives, that they said, why do you stare up to the sky? He will return just as, he, as you saw him leave. But it didn't say he would return on the Mount of Olives. I was thinking about that last night, saying maybe this, the return doesn't have to be a, he'll return from the sky, but it didn't say specifically the Mount of Olives. It just said he'll re return as you see him. So that's now that question is coming about in my mind as to will it be specifically the Mount of Olives? This is where we have this 24 hour by seven camera, but it might be something different. As I keep saying, I believe that we interpret it. Uh, what the uh, scriptures say about the return of Jesus, but uh, we try to speculate on what we think it might be, and I think we may interpret it entirely differently than it re really is. Now, next Tuesday, the 10th day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, or October 4th on our calendar, at sundown, the Day of Atonement is observed and ends on sundown on Wednesday. Wednesday. This is the second of the three fall feasts that Jesus is expected to fulfill when he returns. The period between last Sunday, when Rosh Hashanah started, New Year started, and next Wednesday, when Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, begins, that period is what the Jews are to reflect on the past year. They are to seek forgiveness from God and seek forgiveness from those who have been wronged. This reflects exactly the same attitude that Jesus expect in the, expressed in the gospel reading that we have coming this Sunday. To seek forgiveness and to forgive those who have wronged you. So the ten days between the two feasts are called the days of awe because of the awesome burden that Jewish people are expected to feel both individually and collectively to atone for their misdeeds, to make peace with their brothers and sisters, and then to face God's judgment. Jewish tradition holds that the gates of heaven close as the sun goes down on Yom Kippur and that each individual's fate is sealed at that awesome moment. Now, the books of Leviticus and Numbers describe exactly how the sins of the people are to be atoned for. God told Moses to have Aaron serve as the high priest and follow the instructions that God gave him. Aaron, from the tribe of the Levites, then serves as the first high priest, and the rituals handed down through the Levites, who serve as priests and servants in the temple. So out of the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, is a description of this uh, festival. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall do no work during that entire day. For it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. And from the book of Leviticus, chapter 16 and chapter 23, and in Numbers chapter 29, are the instructions for the priests to atone for the sins of the people on the day of atonement. The first thing, the high priest sacrifices a bull and a goat for the sins of the high priest and his family. The ram will be sacrificed for the sins of the community. Then two goats are selected. One is chosen to be the scapegoat. That's where we get the term scapegoat, who will bear the sins of the people. And then the ram and the scapegoat are offered to atone for the sins of the people. So when the ram and the scapegoat are sacrificed, the blood of the ram and the scapegoat are taken into the Holy of Holies by the high priest and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. This is the only time anyone is permitted to enter the Holy of Holies where God dwelt was on Yom Kippur, and only the high priest could enter. And when anyone else being exposed to the magnificence and power of God would perish. In fact, we saw this referenced in last week's second reading from the first letter to Timothy 6.16, where Paul writes, And whom no human being has seen or can see. Then the high priest 
lays his hands on the scapegoat and verbally transfers the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. And then a man takes that scapegoat far into the wilderness and leaves it to die and with it the sins of the people. So this was done every year from the time of the first portable tabernacle when Moses led the Jewish people from Egypt until the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So what do the Jewish people do today? Here's how the Jewish people celebrate Yom Kippur today. What is Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur is the Jewish Day of Atonement. It's considered the most sacred day of the Jewish calendar, falling at the end of the 10 days of awe, which began with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Like all Jewish holidays, Yom Kippur begins at sundown, and for the following 25 hours, Jews are expected to refrain from eating, drinking, wearing perfume or lotions, wearing leather shoes, and being sexually intimate. Where possible, the day is usually spent praying in the synagogue. There's a tradition that Jews should wear all white garments on this holiday, both because the color white symbolizes purity and because white is understood to reference angelic beings. And on Yom Kippur, the Jewish people are considered to be closer to angels than they are at any other point during the year. The prayers on Yom Kippur center around pleas for forgiveness, mercy, and understanding. The holiday also includes confessions of sins on behalf of the entire community, with a hope that the people, both individually and collectively, can begin the new year with a clean slate, forgiven of all past wrongdoings, misdeeds, and sins. In advance of the holiday, Jewish people are supposed to approach anyone they've hurt during the past year and ask for forgiveness, as it's believed to be more difficult to gain forgiveness for sins committed against God until we have gained forgiveness for sins committed against our neighbors. At the end of the Yom Kippur service, the shofar, or ram's horn, is blown, signaling the end of this high holy day. People usually congregate that evening for a festive meal, which formally breaks the fast. So it's interesting, the parallels here. First of all, look at the fact that the high priest, back when the temple was still around, uh, the high priest would take the blood of the ram and the scapegoat and go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle that blood onto the Ark of the Covenant. When Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood. And as a result, his blood, that, that sprinkling of the goat and the, the ram represented, was a symbol of what then God would have his son Jesus do, shedding his blood. And that's why the, the veil, the curtain, was split in two that separated the Holy of Holies from the people because it was no longer necessary. So that is also perhaps why then God could allow the uh, temple actually to be destroyed because the temple is no longer necessary to get in touch with God, to have a relationship with God directly. It does not need, their, their sins do not need to be atoned for. They can be forgiven by accepting Jesus Christ and accepting his for, the forgiveness of our sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus returns on the specific Jewish New Year, when he does return, an appointed day of Rosh Hashanah that God has in his appointment book, what is thought to happen during the 10 days until Yom Kippur is the opportunity for those who have not received Jesus as the Messiah, their Lord and Savior, be given the opportunity to accept him. Jewish people will have the opportunity to recognize him as the Messiah and repent of their sins just as they have done since the first tabernacle was built. But their sins will not just be atoned for. The word atonement means to cover up. Just as those Christians have had their sins forgiven and never again to be remembered, so will any who accept Jesus when he returns. What will Jesus do when he returns on the appointed day of atonement is fulfilled? It's the last judgment. 
And we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, a thought that this is what is going to occur when Jesus returns to fulfill this feast. Next, I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly standing before the throne and scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls and the sea gave up its dead. Then death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. This pool of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. It is the last judgment when everyone who ever lived will be judged. As the New Testament tells us, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah, God sent to redeem the sins of the world, will have their names written in the book of life. If this interpretation is correct, everyone who accepts him during the 10-day period between the Jewish New Year and Day of Atonement will have their name written in the book of life. They'll then receive their glorified bodies just as Jesus has had since he rose from the dead. Everyone who has died before the judgment will rise from the dead just as Jesus did. Those still alive will be changed into a glorified body. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 1552, he writes, In an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Remember when the description was given of what the Jewish people do on the Day of Atonement today, at the end of the celebration is the blowing of the shofar, the last trumpet. Paul has written in an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. This scripture is used by those who believe that the rapture will take believers off the earth. But rather interp than interpreting that verse this way, I'm inclined to believe that it refers to the instant those who are still alive and have accepted Christ will receive their glorified body. So that's a brief uh, summary of the Day of Atonement and how it may be fulfilled when Jesus returns. Let us pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you again that so much in this study is so important to us and there's so much to it that we ask you, Lord, that you would help us absorb it and understand it, make it part of us. It is so powerful and so magnificent that how can anyone not understand that you sent your son so that we could live and be part of your existence? We just thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us to be part of your existence, to share in your glory, to share in your love, to share in the prosperity that you shed upon all, upon all of us. So we thank you for these lessons. We thank you for the life you've given us to lead in your word and in you. And we thank you that, Lord, you come and live within us. You're with us every second of the day, and we thank you and praise you for that. We receive this lesson in thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.